Welcome, beloved viewer, to HCK, the station that brings light right into your family. It is our program, A Moment at Jesus' Feet, where we seek to study the Lord's Word and find out how to apply it in our lives, that we may be truly furnished for His soon return in glory. We are going to study in this episode 3, the life of the early church, chiefly learning the impact of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles to their day-to-day -day lives. And there, thereafter, you and I will be able to know how we can live our lives in view of the soon coming of Christ Jesus. But before we delve further into our study today, allow me to invite our sister Munini, who is on standby at Siokimau, to just give us a sneak peek of what they have in store for us. We thank God for the breath of life this day. It's our portion in the land of the living. We are also grateful that you can join us for this Bible study. Scripture actually talks of itself and says, all scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, and for instruction in righteousness for the man of God who is you, my beloved viewer, to be complete and thoroughly prepared for good works. Then, hold your scripture as Siokimau Central SDA Church takes us through our study this day, which is entitled Life in the Early Church. We will be looking at Acts from chapter 2 to chapter 5. Welcome. Thank you very much, Sister Munini, for that uh, brief introduction. We hope to clearly understand the impact of deceit in the life of the early church, uh, looking at the life of Anania and Safira. Thank you very much, beloved viewer. At this point in time, allow me to present to you our esteemed panelists who are going to help us to understand the life of the early church, hoping that therefrom, you and I will be able to find some nuggets of wisdom on how to conduct our lives while we are looking forward to Christ's soon return in glory. We have our sister Melanie. Say hello to the viewer. Hello. Hi, thank you very much. We have our sister Mabel. God is good. All the time. And all the time. The Lord is good and that, and that is, his is his nature. nature. Thank you very much of our brother Sam. Say hello. Hello, viewer. Hi. Thank you. Lastly, we have our brother Robert. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good and that's his nature. And I'm your host, Becky Arunga. We do well to begin with an opening prayer from brother Sam. Let's pray. Our precious Lord who is in heaven, what a privilege once again for your children to gather and listen and share your word. God, for that reason, we ask in a special way that you'll pour your Holy Spirit upon our hearts that the discussion of this word will have a blessing unto us and also unto the viewers. Lead us till the very end, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, we understand that our previous study was, was hampered by a technical hitch. But nevertheless, we need to somehow bring to book the impact of Pentecost on the life of the apostles. What are some of the things that stood out for you as an individual, especially as you lived your life, um, based on the study of Pentecost? Melanie? Go first. Yeah, sure. Um, what stood out for me mm -hmm. was that the disciples were in one accord and they were praying mm -hmm. and they were waiting and seeking for the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I, I just uh, recognized from that study that the Holy Spirit doesn't just come to anyone. You have to ask. Mm -hmm. And he says in the word that uh, ask and you shall receive. Mm -hmm. And if you being evil, you know how to give your children good things. Mm -hmm. How much more will the Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit when you ask Him? Amen. So the disciples were not just waiting, mm -hmm. but they were asking for the Holy Spirit and seeking and studying the God's Word. Mm -hmm. So that's what uh, really stood out for me at Pentecost, yes. Thank you very much. Brother Robert, perhaps you comment on something on the gift of tongues as used on the day of Pentecost and its impact in our lifetime today. Thank you, Becky. How did you know that I wanted to comment on that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Speaking in tongues is one of the manifestations. Mm -hmm. sh what shows that the Holy Spirit is in you? Mm -hmm. One of, I'm yeah. saying one of, mm -hmm. there are many. Mm -hmm. But what, what stood out for me is uh, when you read Acts chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, mm -hmm. when they spoke in tongues, they spoke in foreign languages, languages. which people who, did, who, who were not 
uh, you know, well, Jews, Galileans, Galileans yeah. they mm-hmm. could understand. Mm-hmm. It is not just vain babbling. It was languages that people understood mm-hmm. and was God was preparing the church mm-hmm. so that it can go forth and mm-hmm. conquer the world. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. And now, um, regarding the, the Pentecost and the Holy Spirit descending upon the disciples, perhaps, Sister Mabel, what would you basically say regarding the components of the sermon that was given on the day of Pentecost? Yeah, uh, thank you, Becky. On the day of Pentecost, we see that uh, the Spirit having filled them, then there was a little bit of misunderstanding and the people around thought that maybe they were drunk. And then we see uh, a fulfillment of prophecy actually in that time. Because we see Peter speaking to talk and is referring to the prophecy that was told in Joel, in the book of Joel, that in the last days the Holy Spirit uh, would be outpoured and men would prophesy and speak in tongues. So we see that that was, an, that was a fulfillment. So that someone actually brought into context what had been prophesied years back. Then what we see as a result of that is people getting uh, to realize that actually this is the truth. This had been prophesied, now it's, it's been fulfilled, and they were moved. They were convicted. They asked themselves, what shall we do? Then they were told, repent and be baptized. You see, when we get the good news, when we are convicted by the Spirit of God, then we need to ask ourselves, what shall we do in light of this message? Then the answer there comes, that repent and be baptized. Thank you yes. very much. So in, in light of the, the question that, that, that the people asked, what then must we do to be baptized? We find Peter responding that repent and be baptized. And that led to 3,000 being added. Now, from a team of one, they were 120 at the upper room. Their life, they now have 3,000 to deal with. And I think the next question that we are going to learn in our episode today is how these 3,000 now are able to live in light of the differences. The differences increases when you're 3,000, when you're dealing with 3,000 people. And uh, Brother Sam, just to usher us into the study, I would like you to read with us Acts chapter 2, verse 46 to 47. After having these 3,000 added to the faith, how did they live? Please uh, read with us. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 46, the Bible says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily as such as should be saved. Thank you very much. So we find, uh, we have find a very profound statement that every day they continued to meet together. I mean, of course, it, on a light note, they continued to meet together every day, but they continued to remember the Sabbath repeated holy, as it were. <laughs> and then they broke bread in their homes, ate together with sincere hearts, praised God, and God added to them. What are some of the things that stand out that we can pick from that very verse regarding the life of the early church? Brother Sam, you can start us off as the rest. Okay. Name. Number one, mm-hmm. uh, we see fellowship mm-hmm. in the lives of these early Christians. Mm-hmm. And uh, this fellowship was on, wasn't was just uh, based, or rather wasn't just intent on uh, sharing God's word, mm-hmm. but you also notice that they used to break, be- break bread together. So that really I want to believe. It was kind of motivational factor for the brethren to meet together because after that they are going to have something to mm-hmm. to eat together. So fellowship and, and swallowship. Mm-hmm. And number two, as a result of... Okay, before I go to the result of this, we also note that they were singleness. They, they had one purpose. Mm-hmm. Their heart was one. So this is really something that ought to teach us a very fundamental lesson that the prerequisite for God adding unto us more numbers is for brethren to be of one mind Mm -hmm. and of one heart, to be united. Mm -hmm. And this, as a result, it will lead to verses 47, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So should we embrace this life and emulate them? Mm -hmm. Trust me, the Lord is going to add unto us numbers as should be saved. Thank you very much. Sister Melanie, uh, still on the concept of teaching and fellowship, uh, that they, they, they had to fellowship, they taught each other, 
and they broke bread. Verse 45 that we didn't refer, refer to said, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Mm -hmm. What do you think propelled the disciples, the early church, to sell their possessions and live a, somehow a communal sort of life? Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what, what propelled them? Yes. You know, as soon as the Holy Spirit had filled them, it was a miracle. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that had been seen. And since Jesus had promised at his ascension that I will send you a comforter, mm -hmm. and he also promised, he didn't give a set time that he would be coming back, but when they received the Holy Spirit, the next thing that they were expecting is the coming back of, mm -hmm. of their Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So in the disciples' mind, their coming of the coming of their Savior was so... It was just... It was immanent. Yes, it was so near. <laughs> they were like, oh my goodness, we don't, have to, we don't have to own this, we don't have to own houses, we are going home. Mm -hmm. There was so much excitement. Mm -hmm. And that is what propelled them. They, the belief that Jesus' second coming was that soon. Mm -hmm. And it led them to you know, let go of everything, mm -hmm. all the worldliness. Mm -hmm. I wish that could happen mm -hmm. because I believe our God's coming is nearer than when we first believed. Mm -hmm. And if we could just let go of all the worldliness around us mm -hmm. and I'm not saying we go out and now sell our property and our lands and everything. But if that could happen, that would be so awesome. <laughs> but the, the principle is, let's lay aside everything else and focus on what is really important. And that is watching and waiting for the soon, very soon coming of Christ. Thank you. So you realize that they, they had the, 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 the Christ, soon, Christ soon return was the chief driver of their selling of their possession, meeting together. And, and, and fellowshipping and doing every good thing. So I, I gather from your statement that were we to have Christ's second coming yes. at our fingertips or as a driving feature in our lives, then our lifestyles would be different. Yes. Wow, in, interesting concept. As we're looking at the Great Commission, uh, Brother Robert, perhaps you may get into this. The Great Commission in Mark chapter 16, 15 to 16 says that in my name you will cast out demons, lay your hands on the sick and they shall get well. Yes. And uh, all along, Jesus was the performer of the miracles. But then Acts chapter 3 brings us into something interesting. Mm. We find the beggar at Solomon's porch and Peter intently and steadfastly looks at him and says, silver and gold, we have none. We have none mm. But in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Mm. Now, I do not see any other record of Peter healing anyone. But what do you think pushed Peter to try that joke? That joke that okay. worked. <laughs> uh, it was not a joke. Uh -huh. You see, after Pentecost, uh, the book uh, of uh, Matthew chapter uh, uh, 26, mm -hmm. I believe, Matthew 10, 16, mm -hmm. if you read to around uh, verse 19, it tells, you, it tells you that Jesus told the disciples that the Spirit will tell you mm -hmm. what to say. Mm -hmm. Don't be worried what you'll be saying mm. when you reach to the synagogues and all that. Mm. And so to Peter, it was actually not him. Mm. It was the Spirit that was in him that was doing it. But so it's the Spirit that was telling the man there yes. that silver and gold we have none, but in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. That's interesting, yeah. And, and, and you see, Jesus does not ask of you what he has not given you. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Peter stands up with confidence. Yes, we have no silver, we have no gold, mm -hmm. but in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, mm -hmm. stand up and walk. Mm -hmm. And the man actually stood up and walked. Mm -hmm. And so through this manifestation of this miracle, mm -hmm. many realized that indeed Jesus, who was healing, he is now here through mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you realize in uh, the same book, chapter Acts chapter 3, verse 19, mm -hmm. the same question is also asked. Repent. Uh, uh, Peter tells them this, that repent ye therefore and be converted. Mm -hmm. You realize, when people have come, the miracle has been performed. What shall we do? Just as Mabel said, mm -hmm. repent and be converted. Mm -hmm. Because then, your sins will be blotted okay. out. And, 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 and Sister Becky, this shows that Christ's 
still works in his church. He's still active in the life of the, his people in his church, mm -hmm. even up to now, mm -hmm. through the Holy Spirit. If mm -hmm. only we can allow him mm -hmm. to work in, us, in our lives. You know, you see, it is not us to use, the, to direct the Holy Spirit to mm -hmm. use us. It mm -hmm. is us to allow the Holy Spirit to use us as he deems fit. If the church can allow the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to use her, mm -hmm. then great works will be Now done. say, if Robert, now make that statement using now, your name. let me say it again. If, <laughs> if, Robert, I, can allow, if no. I can allow the Holy Spirit <laughs> to work in me, yes. even the selling of possessions mm. that we saw that they were doing mm. will not be a hindrance between me and saving a soul. Mm. Because you cannot put a value on a soul. Amen. So it requires us to stand on the promises of God and yield ourselves to his use. Yes. Now Peter and John have through the Holy Spirit healed this young man. Remember in uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 47 we read that praising God and having favor with all the people. Now my question simply is, did the favor with all the people continue in the life of the early church? Oh yeah. Uh it, it was short-lived because, uh, but before we go to the opposition that came and uh, the favor having been short-lived for at least for a, for, for a time, I wanted to add something on the healing of the lame man. A significant lesson comes from there that it's not a question of money. It's not a question of money. For us, God does not even require us to have money to do something for him. God just wants us to be willing to be used of him. God wants us to be used. You, saw, you see, like Paul and Peter and John, they had given their lives to God. They were witnessing for Jesus, testifying of what they had seen with Jesus. And now they have come to a point where someone is in need. And they realize that the need that this person has is bigger than the need for money. So it's never about just a, a few shillings or something. But we could give Jesus to other people. It would change their lives more than a few, a few, a few more shillings. So then now uh, we look into the whether or not the favor that they found with the people. I have to speak on that favor story. Okay, okay, okay. okay yes. okay, that's <laughs> fine. digest the <laughs> issue that it is not our silver and our gold that God requires really. But Christ has sent us to be witnesses yeah. of who he is. Yeah. And in that witnessing, he has promised to be with us even unto the end of the age. Mm -hmm. And in that witnessing, he is also promised to give us the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, who is our comforter, whom scripture describes as he will come to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, beloved viewer, we take a short break that we may ponder over these issues that we have brought out. Do not go away. Our system we need is on standby to bring to us our complimentary lesson from Siokimao. We'll be right back. God bless you. Thank you for staying tuned to HCK, the station that brings light into your family. As I had promised before the break, our sister Munini is on standby at Tsiokimau Church to bring us our complimentary lesson as we study what God has in store for us. Remember to clearly focus or be reminded of deceit, especially as exuded by Ananiah and Sapphira, and see how you as a Christian can save yourself, or rather depart from being deceitful and go into being an honest Christian in your daily living. Welcome back. We are at Siokimau Central Seventh-day Adventist Church where we are having our discussion on life in the early church and it is drawn from the book of Acts chapter 2 to chapter 5. Remember last week we did study about the Pentecost and after Pentecost our question is, so what happened? I'm Titus Mungo a member of Siokimau Central SGA Church and a teacher also of the Bible study. Just important is that uh, after Pentecost, we find the apostles really strengthened, inspired, because the disappointment that was there when Christ died, 
was again renewed in a way that there was no longer disappointment after resurrection, but now the reality of the Holy Ghost feeling them coming and empowering them to take the gospel out. So then, when I look at uh, this study now, I see the prayer, fellowship and prayers in the church that after Pentecost, the apostles steadfastly moved now into studying what we are calling apostolic teachings, fellowship, breaking of the bread, and prayers, which we summarize into two. It was fellowship and prayers. But uniquely, really, which I would like to see is that private fellowship that was happening here or the fellowship that was happening in the early church was really in private homes that you would find that the disciples will meet together, call even the old apostles, discussing the word of God at home. And for the teachings, they would do the teachings in the temples. There were porches above the temples where rabbinic kind of teachings will happen. And so in this way, you find like, I'll give an example of Gamaliel, the doctor of law he would be able to impart some knowledge even using such kind of environments. But for the apostles, the teachings that they did in the temple reminds us something that I would like us to know that after Pentecost, they did not contemplate of another religion, but they pursued to learn what was it that happened in the Old Testament what happened even up to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ? And where are we going as a church? Which is why they studied more. And when you read uh, like the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 42, it leads us to know that these studies, these teachings, and all these empowered them, prepared them for the second return of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I need also to take something in our understanding of this study. Is that when they were together fellowshipping and having even the ceremonies, you know, remember in those days, they continued in Acts chapter 3 verse 1 with the ceremonies. They did not leave that. But coming back even James chapter 2 verse 2, they still continue to worship in the temples, in the synagogues on Sabbath. So you would see this scenario that we have the temple synagogues for uh, teachings, rabbinic teachings, apostolic teachings, but they would still go home for fellowship and they would still do the ceremonies and a very important now turning of all this for me in this study that I really love for the church today is them now thinking about themselves do we really desire material possessions? Do we really desire what they call the personal property as we prepare ourselves for the next kingdom, for the Lord's kingdom? They sold their properties, as we know, but in this kind of way, they sold and shared among themselves. And this is where we find unity in the church, strengthening of the fellowship, strengthening of the believers, are they shared whatever they had, and you would see that. Is this happening in today's church? I pose that question. Do we see today in our churches the fellowship, ability of members to come together and say, what do I have? What can I share with my friend? Is this going to really encourage us as we go forth? And uh, maybe just to bring out also to the viewers is that the Lord is calling on us. Think about the early church. How did they fellowship? They did it in different places. I have seen in our uh, society today or our, our community today, we go what we call prayer cells at home. Neighbors coming together. Members of the church joining us. And then we worship together. Then in churches also now we have groups where we even call welfare uh, groups that we collect some money, we collect resources to support the needy. And I see this that was happening in the early church. And so let's see this today. And uh, there is a question that was posed really that when we look and I see today even myself and I look at my colleagues, what do I consider the most precious thing that I need to share? Perhaps it is just a garment. It can be money. It can be what to foster the gospel. Let's do it, for the Lord is coming soon. 
the acts of the apostles that are performed in the name of Jesus Christ as they continue to speak about this Christ who died and this Christ who resurrected. But this did not augur well with the leaders in those days and it brought a lot of friction. Let's hear about this friction that happened because of the apostles. My name is Davis Rogonto. I come from Sokimao Central State Church. The rise of opposition in the church. You know, the Apostles have been endowed with the power of the Holy Spirit. They are performing wonderful acts, marvelous deeds, miracles are being performed. And so the leaders in the church, the Jerusalem church, the Sadducees and the Pharisees are now feeling bad. But the name of Christ is being preached. And through that name, many, many people are getting healed. Many are, those who are lame, like now in chapter 3 of Acts, those who are lame were getting their bodies back. And so... There's that opposition that is rising from the church itself. The leaders of the church against the apostles, the message they are preaching. For instance, the, the part of these uh, leaders of the church, the Sadducees, for instance, never believed in the coming, in the, in, the, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when the disciples are going and preaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, 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 the leaders, the Sadducees specifically, are not happy with this thing. And so they... The, 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 the two disciples, to be specific, Peter and, uh, and John, are apprehended. But, and they are put in. They are questioned. And when they are questioned, there's something that is so important that Peter says. He stands and says that in, in Acts chapter 4 and verses 20, 19 and 20, sorry. 19 and 20 says that these men, Peter says that if these things that we are doing, they are not pleasing before your eyes, judge within yourselves if they are of God. But for sure, this act, the lame person walking and many people coming into, into Christendom, it, it, it proves that there is the power of Christ in, 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 in us. And this is the power that is making us to do what? To preach. And so even today, even today, in the church of today, such opposition may arise. When people are coming up with the right message to preach to the world, there are some leaders who are not happy about these messages that are being preached that many souls may be saved. For instance, Christ, when he was leaving this earth, and actually when he was commissioning the disciples to go out, he says that when you go and preach, you will face opposition. And this is actually what was happening to the early disciples, and it will exactly happen in these last days. So when such oppositions are coming, when such uh, leaders may rise against the word of God, one thing we can tell them, they judge amidst themselves. If it be of God, that they may continue going against us, let them continue. But the assurance is that those who will stand for God will not be left. So it's, 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 a, it's a hope for all of us who are preaching that when we stand up, many men will come against us. But the truth is that Christ has overcome all. And if he, if, if he overcame, all of us will also do what? Lots of account. That's an encouragement to us as those who have been left with this everlasting gospel to tell the whole world about Christ. We see that Peter and John had earlier been arrested. And this is the second time that they are getting arrested as we continue with our study into chapter 5. Question is, what exactly happened during this time? During the second arrest of the apostles, most importantly at this point, the difference between the first and the second, the first arrest, it is only Peter and John who were arrested. But in the second arrest, the whole of the apostles were arrested. The reason as to why they were arrested does not differ so much from their first arrest because they were proclaiming the name of Jesus and doing wonders and signs which increasingly did not go down so well with the Sanhedrin. And uh, they were jealous that the apostles were doing certain things that they could not do, but also they were spreading the gospel, which they did not want to reach out to the people. And uh, when uh, the signs increased, and people were getting to know more about Jesus that forced the second arrest. Now, this time, they, everyone was arrested and they were put in jail. Now, in jail overnight, uh, the angel of God appeared to 
the apostles, which is an important lesson point to us as Christians that no matter what happens, however difficult things may be, whatever persecution you may face, that Jesus is always right in with us and will always come and prevail on our behalf. So the angel of God appears and releases the apostles, but giving them an instruction that go to the temple and preach this life to the people. Now, it's very interesting that you are put in jail, you are released, and then you are asked to go do that which made you arrested. More often than not, when people break out of jail or if you are released, you would want to go to a secluded place. But they are told to go and continue with the work. And uh, the following day morning, they go and they continue with the good work of preaching the gospel to the people. And the Sanhedrin come with their associates, uh, of course, under the leadership of the high priest. The Sanhedrin was uh, some kind of a, 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 a council or a group of elders, very eminent people in uh, Israel uh, at that time. And, and these people came together to, they had jurisdiction on, on, on matters religion, had jurisdiction on civil matters, and they also had jurisdiction on criminal matters. The Sanhedrin was in two, uh, two parts, if you may. The lesser Sanhedrin and the greater Sanhedrin. What Every time there is a reference without the qualifying of the lesser or the, the greater, then the assumption is it is always the greater. The Bible talks about the Sanhedrin. And so through and through, we get the view that they were presented before the greater Sanhedrin, which had a, a collection of 70 elders plus the priest 71. The others had 23 or 21 uh, members. Now, they come and settle in the morning, and they send out for the apostles to be brought before them. Unfortunately, when they reached the, 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 the prison cells where they were, they were held, and, and these, the Bible records in, in, in Acts chapter 5 that they were put in the common jail. The common jail was a place where every hardcore criminal was put in together, and it is very humiliating to learn that the people who were spreading the word of God, were put together with, with criminals, which, which was very humiliating on their part. Now they go, uh, they, 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 they command the doors to be opened because they were closed and, and, and there were guards waiting uh, at, 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 at the entrance. And the, the, the place was empty. And that shocked not only the prison officials, but also the head of the Sanhedrin. And after some time, uh, someone shows up and says, hey, the guys you put in, in prison are actually out preaching the word of God. And they were sent and, 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 and they went, they went and, and brought them to the, to the, to the, to the Sanhedrin. Uh, this time, uh, they didn't use force. Now, this is also a very important learning point for us as Christians. That these people were in prison, they were imprisoned, they are released, they are taken to continue spreading the word. And the impulse of human beings is that when you do something bad and you're eventually caught up with, you should receive a thorough beating. Now, these people were not beaten. So we ask ourselves, why were they not beaten? They were not beaten because they feared the people. So many people had gathered the people they were preaching to. And they feared that if they used force, if they beat up the apostles, then these people would turn against them, would stone them up, and would beat them. And so the second time, these apostles have the human shield to protect them from the authorities. And so they were not beaten, and they obey the authorities, and they are brought before 
the great Sanhedrin, who asked them the same question. They were asked before the first Sanhedrin when they appeared. And the bone of contention was why they were preaching the word of God, especially through the name of Jesus, because uh, there was contention. In, 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 in earlier Israel and the early church, the Sanhedrin also had the authority to proclaim who is Messiah and who is not Messiah. They, they had that authority. And so those are some of the things that actually even brought Jesus before the Sanhedrin. So the, the apostles find themselves in the same situation that even Christ found themselves in because the, the, the Sanhedrin wants to not confirm them as preaching the word of Christ who they already disputed and, 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 and they are asked questions why they are doing, they are doing so and, and, and Peter who, who, who was if you may, in, 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 a, in a loose language, you'd call him the head boy or uh, the head of the pact. He was the leader of the apostles at the time. And, and, and Peter says that we'd rather fall, we'll follow the word of God than that of man. And, and, and this infuriates the council or the Sanhedrin. And, 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 and Peter doesn't stop there. Uh, Peter goes down to break it down for them how it started during the times of Jesus and how they actually crucified him. Remember, the Sanhedrin never wanted the blood of Jesus upon themselves. And so you reminding them that actually it is you who killed Christ and the, his blood will be upon you would be something that they wouldn't want to hear. Now, they got infuriated, and at that point, they wanted to the apostles. Now, remember that even though the Sanhedrin had that much far-reaching power, they had limitations. During the time of Jesus, they were limited to not, they could not pass judgment on someone to be killed. Now, fast forward to the second arrest, and now they want to kill the apostles. Something that at that time was a reason for the governor of, 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 uh, of, the, of Roman, the, the, the Roman governor, is the one who could pass that kind of a judgment. And that is why during the arrest of, of Jesus, Jesus was taken to, to the governor. Uh, for, for the governor to pass such a ruling on it. So you see number three lesson we are learning here is the inferiority that the Sanhedrin had, the hatred, the jealousy drives them to even do things that were not permitted by law. The Sanhedrin could not pass the judgment of death upon someone, but here they want to kill the apostles. Why? Because of hatred. They want to kill them. And at this point comes the great teacher, uh, Gamilio. Gamilio was a reputable man, a Pharisee, who had developed uh, over the time eminence in uh, the ancient time and was widely respected. Now, Gamilio stands up and tells the Sardedrin two things. The first thing, he gives a reflection of two occurrences which had occurred before. And then he summarizes his presentation and tells them that these people if whatever they are proclaiming is from man, then it will wither away. But if truly they are proclaiming the word from the living God, then not even you will stand in their way. And at this point, the Sanhedrin appeared confused. Confused and convinced. Why? 
they are convinced because they can see some sense. Remember, the Sanhedrin, which was widely made up of uh, the, the, the Sudeces, did not agree on uh, resurrection, angels, and all those kind of things. The angel comes to open the, 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 the gates of, of, uh, of, of, of the prison, and they don't even make a mention of it when, they, when the apostles appear before them. So that gives us the notion that they actually aware that these people have something supernatural in them. And because of that, because of that, they are convinced that these people may be from God. But they are also confused because of the anger and the hatred for them. So what do they do? They fuse the two. They choose to release them because they know they are saying the truth, but with a thorough beating. And the apostles leave and go joyously. Now, from this point, what we get is how the apostles stood with Jesus. Their faith that no matter what happened to them through and through, they knew that Jesus would be with them. Thank you. Thank you very much for that detailed account. As you can see, life in the early church was not all roses. They had times of affliction. But the words of Christ in Matthew 28, when he gives the commission, go, are coming very true. And he said, and I will be with you to the end of time. Beloved viewer, we have come to the end of our discussion today. But I do believe and hope that you have been blessed. Kindly join us in our next study when we shall be looking in the chapters of Acts 6 to chapter 8. Till then, I have been your host, Munini Mutuku, Siokimau, Central SDA Church. Back to the studio. Oh, what a beautiful discussion, Sister Marine. Thank you very much. We are much more guided, much more enhanced, much more prepared to live our lives as Christians in these last days. Beloved viewer, we take a short break, but we'll be right back to wrap up our discussion on the questions that are really pertinent in the early church. One of them being um, how they dealt with opposition. Um, secondly, how God dealt with deceit from Ananiah and Sapphira in the early church and why he dealt with it the way he did. And then lastly, we shall look at the confidence that uh, the early disciples had in Christ Jesus that even when they were taken to prison, they were not afraid of confessing Christ Jesus. Do not go away. We will be right back. Thank you very much for staying tuned. You are in that last segment of A Moment at Jesus' Feet, courtesy of HCK, the station that brings light right into your family. Our panelists are here with us to just help us prepare in view of eternity, just like the early church did after Christ had ascended into heaven. So now, prior to the break, Sister Mabel, we're discussing on the question of favor. Just allow me to read Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Scripture says, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Juxtaposed against Acts chapter 4, from verse 1 to 4, which says, Now as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who had the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. Mm -hmm. But the question then is, how did the tide of opposition get itself into the early church? Mm -hmm. Seeing as chapter 2 verse 47 says they had favor with all men, yet chapter 4 now brings to view some small uprising or rather some sort of opposition arising um, against the early church. Thank you, Becky. Uh, we see in chapter 4 that they have already started to face now opposition. But what is important to note in chapter 4 verse 4, the Bible says, 
However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. So you, you realize that the number has increased, despite um, Peter and John being arrested. Peter and John had been arrested, but still the number grew from 3,000 to now 5,000. So we see here that uh, Peter and John were preaching about resurrection. But there were a section of the people at that time, known as the Sadducees, who never believed about resurrection. So they came in opposition. Number two, there were people who were called the Pharisees. And by those standards, Pharisees were the most learned people that existed in that society. It's like the highest level of education attainment in our time now. There were PhDs. All of them were professors, I would call them. So now they were challenged. These people, Peter and John, they were just um, ordinary people, unlearned, fishermen. You know, I think they were at the lowest case or cadre if, we if we were to classify people in that category. So they were wondering, how come these people are able to do these things? But the lesson that they had not learned because they had hardened their hearts was that the power was attended, they were attended by the power of God. That they were speaking for Jesus filled by the Spirit of God himself. So you see that they were able to do all these things, and they've met this opposition, but still they were able to increase in numbers because they were attended by the Spirit of God. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Brother Sam, uh, we see that the disciples are speaking and they are preaching Jesus. They are preaching Jesus in the, the, they are preaching in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And then even as you look at the opposition question still, the commission involved tarry in Jerusalem until power is come upon thee, but the gospel of the kingdom is to be preached unto all, unto all, beginning with Jerusalem. And, and what, 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 do you, what can you comment regarding the opposition that is coming, the place of God in the opposition in the early church? Okay, thank you. Before I comment on that, mm -hmm. there is something that touched me mm -hmm. in regard to the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And allow me to read Acts chapter 3, mm -hmm. verses 16. Mm -hmm. And it says, And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. And it continues. Mm -hmm. Now, Peter repeats twice the name of God. Mm -hmm. Now, there is something that is so important we need to understand about the name of God. What gives power to the name of Christ to enable the healing of that particular man? So allow me help us understand what is special about the name of Christ that it can heal. It's not a normal name. And so I will take us to Exodus, mm -hmm. Exodus chapter 34, so that we can understand what is special about the name of God. Exodus 34, and I'm going to read verses 5 and verses 6. Now this is what the Bible says in the King James Version. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So what we expect in verses 6 is the proclamation of the name of the Lord. And here it is. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. That is the proclamation of the name of the Lord. Merciful, goodness, gracious. So whenever you consider mercy, you are simply considering the name of the Lord. So what gives power to the name of the Lord is the character therefore, because thereof, because the name of the Lord is, is the character. So when you consider the power of mercy, you're considering the power of the name of the Lord. That is it. So that's why we pray in Jesus' name, because of the character attributed to the name of, to the, name of the Lord. So back to your question, Becky. Uh, what is the place of God in this, mm -hmm. in this opposition? Mm -hmm. And I thank God he led my brother into reading um, Matthew chapter 10 and it said, uh, don't worry about what you're going to say when you'll be tried in the courts because the Holy Spirit will give you the very words. Mm -hmm. So the place of the Lord is to strengthen you and to make you able to stand against all that opposition. Mm -hmm. So really, we can't worry because the battle is not ours, mm -hmm. but it is the Lord. So once you submit to Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. he will give you strength and words to speak against people who accuse you. Thank you very much. So how, how did uh, Peter and John 
uh, dispel the opposition. Sister Melanie, how did Peter and John counteract the opposition that attended to them, especially after healing the, the man at Solomon's porch? Um, it's funny. I did not expect them to react that way. If I were in their shoes, I think I would be so, you know, after such a, a miracle, mm -hmm. You know, you expect good things, like now things are going to be awesome. But you find that immediately after that, or soon thereafter, they are faced with this opposition and they are arrested and, and they're taken to prison. And um, how they dispelled it, I think it's in, um, let me just get eight. it. I was away from Acts, sorry. <laughs> um, Acts chapter four, yes? Yeah. 4 verse 8, then say, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Then he goes on to give another sermon. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in the heat of the moment, he gives a sermon. Like he didn't come like, say, no, us guys were just trying to help that man, that poor man. They were not even defending themselves. Every opportunity was preach. Preach, preach, and if we could do that, uh -huh. when faced with adversity, when you have a problem, and you find opportunity in mm -hmm. that, you know, that is how they dispel it. Mm -hmm. And God, God favors mm -hmm. those who take every opportunity to mm -hmm. praise Him mm -hmm. and to reach out to people. Amen. It doesn't matter what you're going through; mm -hmm. they were going to go into prison, mm -hmm. but they didn't. They didn't mind that. Mm -hmm. The opportunity they found was doing what to, to preach, preach, mm -hmm. and to those very people. Mm -hmm who are doing what, who are throwing them in prison. Amen. So that is how, uh, it's just intriguing, yeah. their reaction to that. So in a yes. sense, we find that they used their, their setback for, to have a comeback in God. Yes. Like that that when, they had, they, when they had been, they had the higher, as, as Sister Mebo said, these were the most learned. They, had, they used the opportunity to preach to the most learned people of their time. And so the scribes, the Pharisees, the... Caiaphas, the high priest, John, the Alexander, everyone was there. Yeah. And I mean, verse 8 begins by saying, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. meaning he wasn't presumptuous about it. The Holy Spirit led his sermon all the way through. Thank you very much. Sister Mebo is burning with a, with a great desire. As Brother Robert is preparing to tell us about Anana and Safira so that uh, we can continue in this together. Uh, when we read from Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we see that uh, Peter and John are reaffirming that salvation is only in the name of Jesus. Nor is there salvation in any other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So you see that they are reaffirming that salvation is only through Jesus. And Jesus had said that I am the way, the truth, you know? So, but now, uh, you see that now the Pharisees, they now forbid. <laughs> now they told they, they in, in from verse from verse thirteen coming down, we see that now the name of Jesus is now forbidden. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred amongst themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, what a noble miracle has been done through through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so then it spreads no further among the people. Let us severely threaten them that from now they speak to no man in this name. You see that now the persecution starts to set in. And, uh, uh, and I think the reason for this persecution also was to make them go away. Because remember Jesus had told them to, they will preach throughout the world. Not only Jerusalem, but it was now their time to go out there. So you, see, you realize that once they have been forbidden in Jerusalem to speak about the name of Jesus, then they had to run out. They had to go now to Galilee and Judea and Samaria and all the neighboring areas to go and speak now freely in the name of Jesus in those areas. Amen. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, we steadfastly now move to, the, to this wrath that perhaps makes us know that the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament are similar. So <laughs> Acts chapter 5, 1 to We'll just read one to four. But a certain man named Ananiah with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. 
Uh, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Mm -hmm. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who had these things. Brother mm -hmm. Robert, the question then is, is why, didn't God, why did God just take his life away immediately? And, and uh, you know, it has been a question that people ask, where is the grace of God? Because as Sam uh, read uh, uh, Exodus to us, God is always long-suffering yeah. and unto us. Yeah. He wills that all of us may be saved. Mm -hmm. But to this, I want to believe that also to them, grace had been apportioned to them for such a long time. But you know, the scene was, Peter, when he's, he's speaking to them in uh, verse 3, he says that Satan has filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. And you see, it, it, it was a communal thing. The church was starting. It was an infant church. Togetherness was important. And uh, just before you read to chapter 5, we are, we are given an example in chapter 4, verse 36, of man called Joseph, uh, uh, surname Barnabas, the Levite, who, verse 37 says, having learned, sold it and brought the money and laid it, laid it at the apostles' feet. And so this was a practice, so that the church can be together. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, even Paul himself reminds us that do not forget the act of meeting together. Yeah. Because it is important, that fellowship. But now to this Ananias and Sapphira, they conspire. The church is filled by the Holy Spirit. Mm. The Spirit was pleading to them that, please don't lie. Mm. I want to believe. Mm. It was pleading. Don't lie. Don't take some back and give some. Mm. And if, 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 if you take it then like that, it means that there is something these people wanted to gain in the eyes of the believers. Mm. Maybe some favor. Yes. Maybe just to be seen that, uh, mm. you know, mm. yeah, yeah, they've also sold, they've also brought, but in their heart, you know, the Bible says, the heart is the most deceitful. Yeah. It is only God who can know it. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jesus warned us in uh, <coughs> Matthew chapter 12, verse 32, that a word against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. Mm. I, I, I want to, to ask again, could this be a sin against the Holy Spirit that they did? which could not be forgiven. You know, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, the, uh, Ezekiel tells us that the soul that sinneth shall, die. shall die, isn't it? Yeah. Every, because we know the wages of sin is death. death. So every time we sin, we know that at the end of the day, death awaits us. And so when the Holy Spirit, I want to plead with the uh, dear viewer, when the Holy Spirit is pleading with us that this is wrong, do the right thing. Please listen to that voice of the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. I gather from your statement that we never know when probation closes yes. for us as Christians. We may exactly. be toying with the grace of God and pushing it beyond limits, but we never know when our... The Kiswahili says, Siku ya muizi ni arobaine. We do not know when our 40th day perhaps may reach and the grace of God has been stretched beyond limits yes. that the only option is for us just to be withdrawn from his favor and die. As we wrapping up this conversation, I am amazed by something that happens in Acts chapter 5, um, verse 29. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. We find the apostles affirming and saying, we'd rather Peter 529, but Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And uh, the, the situation is... Uh, the apostles have been arrested for a second time mm -hmm. and they have been placed before the council for trial. Mm -hmm. But then there is someone somewhere who gives advice on how these men ought to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would like us to focus on. What is the position of the Gamaliels in our 
lifetime today in our in in our current generation who are the gamaliels of our time and how ought we treat them uh, just to read one of the verses um verse 34 of acts 5 says then one in the council stood up a pharisee named gamaliel a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while mm -hmm. sister mebo mm -hmm. talk to us about gamaliel uh, my interpretation of this could be that God used Gamaliel to preserve their lives. Because at this second trial, the Sadducees were furious. They wanted to kill them, actually. They wanted to kill them because they continued to preach the message of resurrection and the message of Jesus. And they were furious they wanted to kill them. So God has used many people in different times. Remember even the Pharisees, they looked down upon these people. Because Pharisees was like the highest, a professor, and then now a professor and an unschooled person. And you see now here a professor coming to the defense of these people. Because at least he understood. Much as he knew that they were not at his level, they couldn't have dialogue at that level. But I believe it was the Spirit of God that used um, uh, Gamaliel a very educated man at that particular time to intervene. And so you, real, you see that the lives of Peter and John were spared. They were not killed at that particular time. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Stamil, and he has something to add? Yeah, uh, just on counsel. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I picked from uh, Gamaliel's, um, what, what he, he, he came in to um, advise. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading from Proverbs 11, verse 14. Proverbs 11, verse 14. The Bible says, uh, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I will just read uh, quickly, in addition to that, Psalms 119. Psalms 119. There's something that I came across that really struck my heart. Uh, Psalms 119, verses 24. Uh, the Bible reads, Thy testimonies also are my delight, and my counselors. The place of Gamaliel at that time, we already read and we see how God used Gamaliel. Mm. But who are the Gamaliels right now? Mm -hmm. We find that from the Bible, the testimonies of Christ themselves are counselors. Amen. Like the spirit of prophecy, the books, uh, Ellen White, when you read them, you know, those are counsels. And we are will be wise to follow the what? The counsels. And the Bible itself, the, Jesus himself says, this they testify mm -hmm. of me. Mm -hmm. The Bible itself is what? Is counsel. Mm -hmm. And as the wise man put it in Proverbs, where there's no counsel, people do what? People perish. People perish. Mm -hmm. There are some things which are not needful. There are some, let me say, mistakes that we need not make. I'm talking uh, from the point of a youth. Mm -hmm. There are mistakes I need not to make. All I can do is refer to counsel from the Bible and uh, inspiration and get what counsel says and follow and heed to that. Mm. I will spare myself and many people will spare themselves a lot of trouble if only we could heed to counsel. Okay. So let us listen to the Gamaliel of our time. Who is the Bible? And the Bible. <laughs> yes, and we will save ourselves a lot of trouble. Amen. Thank yes. you very much. Brother Sam, Yes. you've got something to add on that? Sure. Thank you. Proceed. Uh, there is an English statement that says, the end justifies the means. So allow me, Becky, and I have a burden for this. I want to give us a practical, a, a practical application or not on the lesson that we learn from Gamaliel. See, there are many brethren in this Christian walk who tend to doubt the genuineness of someone's conversion. So my challenge to that person is you're not the Holy Spirit to know whether that person has been genuinely converted so that you walk around condemning that person. Why don't you praise God that that person is serving God? You see, there are some people, because the past experience of this person is characterized by sin and all those stuff, so when this person comes to church, you're like, wow, oh, this person is going to come and corrupt many of our brethren. So my challenge to that person is, you're not the Holy Spirit to know the genuineness of that person's con conversion. So praise God because he's in church. Amen. Uh, Brother Robert, you conclude. Uh. Yes, just uh, in a bullet. Chapter 5, Acts uh, verse, eight, 38 and, uh, verse 38 and 39, just still on Gamaliel. 38 says, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, lest... Let them alone. For if this counsel 
all this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. Lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. What that means is that, you know, there is an example there, uh, given, two examples actually, of people who came, preached, they got followers, but then uh, after they died, they were, their work also died. But he's telling them, if this work is of God, you can't fight God. What do I want to say? There are so many works of men nowadays. You know, even churches, their banner, instead of holding the banner of Christ high, it is the banner of an individual. When that an individual dies, what happens to that church? Indeed, every church, every person, every listener should ask himself, wherever I worship, this God that I worship, is it this work of God or of man? Because if it is of man, then you are doomed. Thank you very much. Beloved viewer, it has been a very beautiful interaction with you to just glean our lessons from the early church. It is clear that when the Holy Spirit filled the apostles, their focus was on the second coming of Christ. And that focus propelled them to do everything it takes to fast track the second coming of Christ. The challenge to you and I is how often do we think about Christ's soon return in glory? And after thinking upon it, how does it, how do we live when we know that Christ is coming soon? What do we do about that knowledge? It is my sincere prayer that the knowledge of Christ soon return in glory would propel us to actively take part in witnessing that when he comes in glory, we may receive him with joy, with glad adoration as we are caught up with him in the clouds. Sister Mabel, close with a prayer. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for your leading. We thank you, Lord, for your presence which is here with us. We pray for a special blessing unto each one of us and for our dear viewer. We pray, dear Lord, that you will speak to them in their hearts, in their homes, Lord, that as they fellowship, O King of Glory, they will seek to know you more. Father, we pray that these words that we have spoken today, may they just be eye-openers. May they just raise questions in our dear viewers and listeners' uh, ears and in their hearts that they will seek you, Lord, because you have said that if we seek you, we will surely find you. We pray, dear Lord, that you bless this work, O King of Glory, and use it, Lord, to reach many of the people. May you be with us, Lord, even as we prepare for other sessions, Lord. We pray that you keep and preserve us until another time. We believe all these things and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for staying tuned to HCK. We have come to the end of a moment at Jesus' feet. But you can like us on Facebook, Hope Channel Kenya. Follow us on Twitter at Hope underscore Kenya. And if you missed our show, we have this and several others on our YouTube channel at Hope Channel Kenya. Till next time, be blessed.